Well, how excited are you? I'm pretty damn excited about this panel um, because this is how I get to go into space, even vicariously. Um, okay, so this is the culmination of our, of our two-day event. We have a lot of new guests coming in. Um, presumably, you're all also, like me, super keen to learn about the different skills in the workforce. Uh, we need to know about dust. We need to know about how we're going to procreate in space, how we're going to rescue people in an emergency on the moon. So many things, and we're going to need all sorts of skills to do that. Um, now, we're very lucky to have quite an interesting and diverse panel. And look at just how big, normally you have a panel, it's three or four people. But I think it could be <laughs> twice this size again, when you start looking at what we are trying to tackle and deal with and the skills we're going to need in space. Um, and we're also very grateful to have uh, Ingrid Marsh, the lovely Ingrid Marsh, who is the um, Director of Cicada Innovation. One of your staff was on uh, yesterday's panel, in fact, and was deeply impressive, very impressive. Um, and Ingrid is also uh, was involved in the New South Wales Space Industry Development Strategy. Have I got that right? Look at me, Jane. Space Industry Development Strategy. So knows a thing or two about space. Um, and Ingrid, I'll, I'll hand to you to handle the panel. Yep. I'm just going to handle you. Um, and, and also introduce our wonderful panel as well. It's just uh, yeah. when I think Virginia is connecting herself with us. Thanks very much. And before we kick off, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so to kick things off, I'm just going to introduce the panel and let them tell you a little bit about themselves so you can sort of understand where they're coming from. So starting right here, we've got uh, Professor Virginia Kilborn. She's the Chief Scientist of Swinburne University of Technology. In May 2021, um, Virginia was appointed as Swinburne's inaugural Chief Scientist in the role, Professor Kilborn provides leadership in science within and outside the university, drives scientific relationships and policy with government, industry and schools. Prior to this appointment, Professor Kilborn was Dean of Science at Swinburne and is known as a champion of women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Professor Kilborn. You want me to say something? Yeah, tell, tell know, us a bit about yourself. <laughs> so... Uh... Nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Virginia and my background is in radio astronomy. So I loved science as a kid and I went and did, um, studied astronomy at uni and I've been doing astronomy ever since. Had a little bit of a U-turn, I guess. No, maybe not a U-turn, but a kink in the road and um, moved into the space area. But also really keen on um, education and um, out outreach, outreach and trying to help um, our young people um, be able to fulfill the careers that they would like to do. So um, really looking forward to this panel. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and next we've got Jason from Sabre Astronautics. He's uh, basically the godfather of space in, in Australia. So he's the CEO of um, Sabre Astronautics. And Jason, I'm wondering if you can just tell us about your journey coming into space. Uh, okay, happy to. Um, so I. I've always been passionate about space ever since I saw Star Wars as a, as, as a, as a kid. I, I wasn't a very good student. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, as, a, as a high school and a junior high school student, I barely graduated, you know? Um, and I, I, I think we, what I learned was, was I had a lot of ideas, but I didn't know how to apply it. And it wasn't until uh, years later when I, when I was in my mid twenties did I really understand how to, how to be a good student. Uh, so I, I, I kind of relate to a lot of people you know, that, that are in, in school where you're, you're, some of you are really good academically, some of you might not be. I, I'll say it doesn't really matter if you have the passion and the drive for this industry. Uh, it is a type of industry where you can be creative. You can come up with the ideas, not just us up here having the ideas that you would plug into. You can kind of grab the projects you want to do. So my, my own journey was um, my mother was a science fiction writer. Uh, she was a failed science fiction writer. Ended up, uh, she she couldn't she couldn't publish them. Uh, but she had on on her wall all the classic sci sci fi books you could possibly have, and that was part of the motivation. Uh, and um, I, I I loved the idea of going to space so much uh, that I I wanted to build products uh, and be an inventor. 
of, of new products. So I came up with my own ideas and uh, you know, people would, would say, oh, that's a good idea. It's a bad idea. It doesn't really matter. You develop what you, what you feel you're interested in. And over time you get better and better at it. And it's just practice. Uh, and you know, I run a company of other people doing that. And, and I help them kind of, kind of go through that invention process themselves. And I really wanna see all of you kind of start that journey because you're at the right age where if you really enjoy this type of thing, then any one of you could uh, build your own space stock. And Jason, could I ask you to maybe just very quickly tell the audience what Sabre does? Uh, Sabre is a space operations company. Uh, so we fly satellites for a living. Uh, we do space traffic. Uh, you know, we, we uh, monitor where things are in, in the sky, kind of like uh, uh, you know, NORAD, like if you see in the movies where, where Tom Hanks says, Houston, we have a problem and all these people on the ground try and solve the problem. That's our job. Thanks very much. Next, we have Mark Hello. For, he's the business development manager with DNI, which is a leading industrial design consulting, C, providing a complete product development from concept into production. Mark is finalizing his PhD in mechanical and manufacturing engineering at UNSW um, for submission next year and has worked extensively in the manufacturing industry over the past 10 years, assisting the development of products in aerospace and medical devices industry. Mark, can you tell us about your connection with space and how, how you found your way there? Well, um, it's pretty wibbly, wibbly wobbly um, getting to that, <laughs> that stage. It's never nonlinear. Um, but, you know, starting, um, I went to, I grew up in Sydney. I went to school in Western Sydney in Holsworthy in Liverpool. Um, and uh, kind of went all the way through public education, ended up at UNSW in 2012, which is now 10 years ago, um, and did uh, mechatronics, uh, robotics engineering there. And I liked it so much, I never left and did my PhD there as well. Um, and that's been six years running uh, as part-time and I've got to finish in February, otherwise they kick me out. Universities don't like you being there for too long, as you would know. <laughs> um, and look, my background, I've worked since um, a very young age in manufacturing. So I worked for a lot of different manufacturing companies out in Western Sydney, um, in Ingleburn, um, then moved out towards Nerlin, um, further out to Southwest Sydney, any further out and I'll be in Goulburn. Um, and I've been involved with the development and uh, manufacturing and kind of helping a lot of different companies develop their products in the aerospace industry. Um, I've kind of seen quite a big uptake in the past, say, five or six years with the big um, companies such as, not much Sabre, but um, Gilmore Space and Newman Space and all the different space companies coming up with their own IP and innovation and all the offshoots that come off. Um, there's different manufacturing companies such as Roma uh, and Sefton were developing their own componentry that goes into um, uh, rockets that are going to space you know, this year, next year, and each person has their own specific space. So my background is being involved with everybody there and kind of bridging the gap between academia and industry, which is um, engineers aren't good talkers and academia don't like to engage with industry too much. So being in between and translating is really powerful. And that's what, I'm, yeah, what I like to do. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Uh, next, we've got Christian, Christian Mask manager and space communicator with the Australian Space Discovery Centre that the Australian Space Agency runs. Um, it's a fun and interactive space of the Space Agency. He is First Nations person from Northern New South Wales and previous roles include consulting with the CSIRO and Department of Education of South Australia, empowering young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to lead their own learning with science inquiry projects and workshops. Christian, can you tell us how you ended up working in space? Oh, it's a bit of a story. Um, so, uh, first of all, you're thinking, well, what in, what in heck and heck is a space communicator? Well, it's just a, just a science communicator for space. So, um, what I do at the Australian Space Discovery Centre is, uh, you know, sort of chat to the public, chat to schools. We have workshops, you know, you can develop your own mock Earth's observation satellite and all sorts of things. But we might ask such questions as, you know, if you would go to space, uh, who, oh, well, sorry. So, if, if, who here would go to space? So, if we would go to space, who here would go to space? Just put your hands up. Who here would go to space? We've got lots of keen space explorers here. Who here would be just happily just happily be here right on the ground and just, you know, not go to space. But that's totally valid too. Um, and who here would be like, oh, you know, I might be a bit cautious. So maybe, maybe possibly that's okay too. And it's good that we can explore, you know, why you might, why my people love to go to space, what the value of the space industry brings everyday Australians back down here on earth. And, um, 
uh, for those that stay grounded to see how we can, all the wonderful range of jobs that you can have um, in the space industry without having to go into space at all, because most of the jobs that are down here in space are, are to do with um, uh, here to support uh, in, right down here on, on planet Earth. So there we go. Um, I think I'm talking about space communication rather than who I am uh, <laughs> as a person. So let's let's uh, let's rewind back. So um, I guess I got into this role through like a series of other roles with um, uh, science communication. So working like with students in New South Wales, they uh, with their Aboriginal Education Consultative Group and the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Mathematics Alliance, we, I had to do some workshops that combine mathematics and culture together and specifically maths and arts sort of together as well. So that was really exciting. And the reason why I got excited into science in the first place was um, because of my father actually. Um, so my father's Aboriginal um, and he used to take me and my younger sister around to um, Copeton Dam, which is near my hometown of Inverell. And there's a lot of quartz sort of crystals there. And it was really interesting to look at the structure of those crystals um, and the science behind it, but also the beautiful patterns around it as well. So that was gorgeous. And he'd look at the formation of rocks and ask, you know, what kind of rocks are these? Um, what else would you look at? Um, look at the constellations in the sky. There's lots of really good stories and uh, and and um, pictures in the sky that's that have really important science behind it as well. So lots of good things there. So uh, he just instilled within me a curiosity that I, you know, I that I'd like to bring to the Australian Space Agency and sort of get that out of you guys to kind of think about what passions you guys have, what skills you have, what talents you have, because you all all have skills, you all have talents, and then thinking about how we can bring that out to bring out the best in you to, for, for your future careers and, and going forward. So there we go. Thanks very much, Christian. Thank you. Um, next, we've got Dr. Geraldine barker Trivano, a Specialist Senior Manager at Deloitte Space. Dr. Geraldine is a PhD qualified research scientist and engineer responsible for capability development at Deloitte Space. Her expertise includes business, technology, scientific and engineering advisory for the space sector and its value chain. Geraldine, do you want to talk a bit about how you got into space? Yeah, um, I got into space because when I was young, and well, actually, I still do, uh, I'm obsessed with Japanese anime. And uh, when I was nine years old, I watched a show called Gundam. Uh, in this show, people live in a space colonies and they pilot these gigantic robots and fight wars in space. And even though it touches on topics like child soldiers. I did not pay attention to that. I just thought that the colonies looked cool and uh, I just wanted to build one. And uh, I knew at that point that if I wanted to either build a space colonies or space assets, I needed to study science and engineering because that's, that's what you do. And I always liked physics, chemistry, biology. And when I, uh, when I was looking for career options, I quickly found out that if you do engineering, you either get to do lots of physics, lots of, um, in some instances, chemistry, if you do chemical engineering, but there's not really a course that does physics, chemistry, and biology, all three, with exception of one very niche new course that showed up in uh, UNSW's curriculum, which was nanotechnology. So I did not think about career pathways or like potential jobs that I would get after finding, uh, finalizing a nanotechnology degree. I just said, oh, I like physics, I like chemistry, I like biology, I'll do nanotechnology. And when I did nanotechnology, I did get to do all three of them. And uh, when I was in my last year, uh, even though I enjoyed my four years a lot, I realized that, well, back, back when I was still in my fourth year at uni, which was a while ago, um, there were not really many career options in Australia for people graduating with a nanotechnology degree. Uh, to this day, I don't think there's many unless you go for other industries. And uh, I decided to do a PhD. And this was actually a combination of desperation because I could not find a job. <laughs> and also because I really liked research. And um, so it wasn't, it wasn't like the worst thing that I could do. I did enjoy research, but it also came from desperation because I couldn't find a job. 
And uh, it's during my, last, probably my third year uh, as a PhD that I attended a career event organized by UNSW. And uh, Deloitte, which is the company that I currently work with, is uh, they were they had a booth in uh, in the conference, and I asked the question of like, oh, do you guys hire people coming from engineering degrees? Because um, normally, when you think about Deloitte, you think about like financial advisory or economics or tax. So I I had that question myself, or can I can I actually work at Deloitte coming from an engineering background? And the answer was yes. So. <laughs> I thought like, oh, I'll give consulting a try, even though at that point I didn't really know what consulting was about. Uh, but again, out of desperation, you, you kind of just apply to everything when you come in from a STEM. And when I joined Deloitte, I never thought that I would ever go back to like my nine-year-old self and with this dream of working in a space. But now I'm working at Deloitte a space. So yeah, it's like finally my dream came true. Thanks very much, Geraldine. Um, and then finally, we have Faye Ghani. She's a research assistant at the Heart Research Institute. Faye has explored several different research areas like ophthalmology, pulmonary physiology, and cardiovascular biology. That's all a mouthful. And is interested in understanding the behavior of cells and tissue in micro environments, especially during human spaceflight and microgravity. Faye, do you want to? share with the audience your background and how you came to space. Yeah, sure. So thank you so much for that introduction. And it's really great being here with all of you and seeing you show up. Um, so when it comes to space, that was always a thing or um, an area that I always had an interest in ever since I was a child. But for me going into space, it, I didn't want to become like a rocket engineer or an aerospace engineer or study astronomy or space science. I think that's something I just always loved reading about, but I always loved human health. And I always felt like human health is something that I valued highly and that I was always interested in in school as well. And so I decided to do a Bachelor of Biomedical Sciences at university. And then I did an honors research year in ophthalmology and visual sciences. So all in the medical field. But deep down, I always wanted to be in the biomedical space industry and space research world. And so it was only last year that I was really fortunate. And um, I think it was just a great opportunity that I was able to work on a lungs in microgravity project um, back in New Zealand at my university. And that was my first exposure really to studying the lungs and having this whole project about computational modeling of the lungs in microgravity, where it combined my passions in human physiology along with my passions of human space flight and looking at microgravity environments. So for me, I've identified that human space flight and space medicine, which are two completely different things, they're very exciting for three different reasons. Number one, human space flight and advancing what we know, we are able to send people to space safely. We know what happens to their body. Um, doctors, clinicians, exercise physiologists, scientists, we're aware of what goes wrong, what goes right. And so we are able to send people into space, which is where the future of space is heading. So that's why space medicine is exciting. Number two for me from a biomedical science and early career researcher background, why I find it exciting is because microgravity is a changed environment. It's different. We are putting cells, living systems, organs, whole people in an environment that is different than what we're used to here on earth, where gravity has been a part of our evolution ever since mankind had started. So that is another way we get to explore cells and living systems and tissue microenvironments in microgravity. It's like a new laboratory for us scientists to play around with cells. And number three, what makes space medicine so exciting is that it's an area that pushes our curiosity. The whole idea of space is people look up into the sky when it started and they're like, what is out there? You know, how do we develop technologies to see what's out there, to gather data, to look into the star, to look at the universe, to look at galaxies. So putting the human body in space, we are able to push what we know and to go even further and to create more and more knowledge and have a better understanding of the world outside and the world within. Thanks very much, Faye. So I think as diverse range of backgrounds and I'm keen to sort of ask the audience you know who's interested in engineering yeah who's interested in science really interested in either of those technical things but really interested in like human interaction and communication and that kind of thing fantastic right because what you've heard from the panel so far is irrespective of your background you can have a career in space so one of the 
that I thought would be interesting to ask the panel about is whose job existed when they were a kid, the job that they're in now? Did that job exist? Anyone? Okay, so I think I think Jason's probably our outlier for two reasons. One, he knew he wanted to be in space as a kid. And two, the career that he he chose to pursue existed as a child. So I'm interested to explore what that looked like versus, you know, some of the other people on the panel where this didn't when they were a child. So, you know, how it was that they joined those dots, I guess, to, to arrive at where they did. So, Jason, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I, I guess it's important also to kind of, uh, obviously from the accident, I'm from the United States. And uh, space has always been there, right? It's, 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 it's a $400 billion market, right? I think the difference is when you're in the States growing up, it's always understood that the industry is there. Mm. You, I never had somebody telling me you can't do space growing up. It's a big mm. difference as an American kid growing up versus an Australian kid. Uh, and you know, so when I said I want to be an astronaut someday, people were like, oh, yeah, yeah you can kind of do that. You know, it was kind of what I was going for. It's what I wanted to be. I just wanted to be a Jedi. You know, I want to be Luke Skywalker. Now I'm older. I want to be Mace Windu. That's what I want to do. But, uh, but no, that's, that's, that's the truth. And, and, and you're, it, it's understood that you could be whatever you want to be as a person growing up. Uh, and in Australia, what I hear, I, I don't know the, the high school student, but university students are told by the professors, you have to be careful, you have to be cautious, you have to do something where there's money. Uh, you hear that a lot. And, and, and people are taught that the dreams that you have, well, they're not realistic, you have to do something practical. And uh, you know, my, my advice there, uh, especially since now we have a, an agency, we could do, do all these things, is if this is something you really wanna do, focus on what you love, focus on your own passions and everything else will follow. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fantastic advice. And I think that probably certainly resonates with me that, that I think it has been very common in Australia that people take a very practical approach and that certainly the advice that they receive um, from key people growing up is, oh, that's very nice, but you may want something practical to fall back on yeah, yeah, if yeah. that doesn't work out. It, you know, it, it, it's, and it's funny, like, like this, that's the thing. Like I talk to adults who are told, hey, we can never do space. Yeah. It, so Australia's in it now. We're in it for good. It's not going away. And everybody's telling me we need to hire space engineers. Where are they? Yeah. Right. So all of you, if this is something you want to do, there is a future. Right. So, but it's, it's, you didn't grow up with it. You didn't grow up with, when people talk about success and about space, what do you think of? Do you think of the Australian Space Agency? Raise your hand if you think of the Australian Space Agency when you think of space success in Australia. A few people. What about NASA? <laughs> okay, so that's, that's, that's the difference. And that's what you need to change. And you've got to realize that the success comes from you. Every last one of you in this room, you are the future of where the Australian space industry is going to be. And then the definition of success is not how many NASA people can we can, you know, no offense, there are NASA people in the room. I love you, you know, but, you know, but, but that's the, the, the metric for success. How successful are we as a community? And, and, you know, this is your future. So you're the ones who have to own it. And it's our job to help you own that. That's, that's where we come in. Yeah, completely. Christian, I was wondering, I guess that might be a nice segue a, to the Australian Space Agency and what they're doing to, to inspire the next generation of, of uh, space entrepreneurs and, and workforce, um, but also talk about how you bounced about to, you know, like find yourself in this space. Question, Ingrid. <laughs> Let me try to answer it. <laughs> um, so um, I guess... How I got into the Australian Space Agency, it's uh, I, I haven't I haven't gone through I haven't completed a degree. I had great difficulties at university. I tried university three times. Studying is just not for me. But I what what happened was when I was at university, I made good connections with um, the, some some wonderful organisations, including Department for Education South Australia, which then linked me with the the you know, the New South Wales Aboriginal Educational Consultative Group, 
so I could do some workshops. And then through that, those workshops, I was made, able to make really genuine connections. So connections that, you know, you could make deep, genuine uh, friendships and connections with to then have some work experience to then bring that across to the agency. So... Um, Can I question on that, Christian? So given that you weren't great at university, yeah. how is it that you ended up there? It's so curious. I'm, I'm, I guess um, what I did was that I um, had really good support network with the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, groups that were at the universities, which was really good. And just through emails and things, and they had some good connections. So I just sent through an email saying, yeah, I'd love to help out here doing this. Just say yes, yes, yes. Taking on, ha having a bit of courage and taking up some leadership sort of roles and and that uh, that is tricky like even being here I'm I'm kind of a a bit nervous you know that that which makes sense you know if you're on a panel it makes sense to be a bit nervous right so it's kind of like but just having the courage to kind of say you know what I, I'm going to give it a shot I'm going to go I'm going to just try it anyway and then by doing that it opens up doors so um just by just by going through that process, so I'm I'm trying to find well, what are my talents? What are my strengths? Mm. And and that is making these connections and and genuine relationships um, with with people, and not necessarily a lot of people, but just with, mm. with you know just trying my best and and trying to make make people feel like they're valued and validated and and appreciated. And I appreciate you guys for for coming here. Yeah, uh, y'all coming here. Thanks for coming. So, yeah. what the Australian Space Agency is doing? Because um, we heard earlier that there's going to be twenty thousand new jobs in the space sector by twenty thirty. Um, what work is the Australian Space Agency doing to try develop that workforce of the future? So that's a very ambitious target. Um, so I, I think um, we need to hire a lot of people. We need to have a lot of support, um, a lot of support industries to be able to um, support those roles, have a lot of scaffolding, have a lot of, uh, I'm just using words. Um, <laughs> that's it. Sorry. Um, what we need is um, we've got some good initiatives. So there's one that's, um, so... We've got the Moon, Moon to Mars initiative where we've got um, we've got uh, 150 million dollars um, that the government wants to support industry with. So 50 million dollars of that was roughly towards building a lunar rover, mm -hmm. which can then kind of analyze some some lunar soil. We call it regolith, and then sort of um, for for these oxides in the soil, and that's really really useful. We want to support um, activities on the moon going out to Mars and then also for rockets because a lot of the weight on, on rockets is the fuel. And so mm -hmm. if we can develop some of that fuel on, on the moon, then we can be a lot more ecologically friendly down here, a lot more sustainable. It's really good. So, and that'll be with a, in conjunction with NASA. NASA will be processing some of that. So we've got, we've got that going on. And, and can you talk a bit about the work that you're doing at the Space Discovery Centre? Oh, yeah. So um, the Australian Space Discovery Centre is, is where you guys can sort of come in and have a look at some really great interactives, especially around launches and satellites. You can drag astronauts around in the space habitat, see them wash their hair and do things day to day. Um, is um, We've got, well, we've got the wonderful uh, a surprise behind some glass that uh, Jason surely knows about. Um, it's got, it's a real live mission control um, that is operated by Sabre Astronautics or Jason over here. So it's really, really, really exciting. So if you ever have the chance, we'd love to see you in Adelaide. But I understand that, you know, some of you guys, well, I'm not going to be in Adelaide. Why do I need to go to Adelaide? Well, there's a reason, there's, that's one reason. But if you don't want to go to Adelaide, there's, there's wonderful things that you can have a look at that are really just curious. So we do have things like you can see stuff in space, the amount of satellites, just the thousands and thousands of satellites that we have in space, and also the amount of junk that we have in space, thanks to some of that. And we need to find some really good solutions to that. And so we need some really good creative and innovative minds to think about how we can reduce that. 
and and some of that might be you know with wonderful technology but some of it might be around things like policy so we need like space lawyers and we like that to scaffold that as well so there's lots a lot of exciting going on. things a lot um, going on yeah um say you in one of the things that there's a lot of conversation about within the space sector is the need for more women in space um and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your journey as a woman in in the science and space which you know uh, generally have an underrepresentation of women. Yeah, sure. So I think like many women, I obviously want to see more women in the space industry, want more women in science and engineering, pretty much in all aspects of life, because we do represent half of the population, but you definitely don't see that in the workforce, especially in leadership roles higher up. So with me, I've definitely been very fortunate enough that all of my teachers, supervisors, mentors that I've come across have been super supportive. Um, obviously, there have been people on the way, you know, not great, but I would say the majority of people that I've worked with, that I've studied with have been really great. And I think another thing as well is, you know, as a woman, you always feel like you need to work twice as hard or three times as hard. You need to be very confident. You need to be um, very out there. You know, I always push myself outside of my comfort zone. So I know for some other women who are more hesitant, maybe a little more shy, it's a little more difficult for them to really um, assert themselves where you need to be really assertive to have your place, which, you know, isn't always great, but that's the reality of where we are now. And I think another thing of me being a woman in science and doing well in science, I'm very fortunate that both of my parents were super supportive of that. I had a support system. So my dad is like an engineer and scientist and he's been in science his whole life. And he was always very, still is very supportive of me being in science. I never felt like I couldn't do something because I was a girl or because I was a woman. Um, so having that environment is really important, whether it's from your family, whether it's from your friends, whether it's from your school. And I think it has to do a lot with just how we raise our kids, um, the sort of ideals that we put into their minds. Um, and yeah, you just feel like you can really do anything. And yeah, seeing women in space, in science, is something that's really, really important. And I hope one day I'll be able to live to see it where we are represented equally. Um, and to be in places where we are there, not because you are a woman, it's like, oh, let's employ another woman because you know we need diversity, but because we're qualified enough and brilliant enough to be in those places and to you know run these institutions and these organizations and these ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, look, you've you've touched on it. There's so many different dimensions around school, family, um, you know, workplaces that, uh, you know, help support change in this area. And so I wondered if I could bring Professor Kilbourne in to talk a bit about her role as the chief scientist with Swinburne in terms of communicating, I guess, across the ecosystem um, inside the university, outside the university and with industry to really encourage um, STEM more broadly, but also STEM for, for women? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, I am the first chief scientist at the university. And so uh, when I got the job, I um, actually wrote the position description. So um, it's really exciting to be in a role where you get to say, what you would like to do. And one of those things that I was really keen about is giving opportunities to um, school kids. So um, like yourselves, what year are you in? Year 10, okay, great. So um, I think year 10 is a very special time in your um, education, especially for science, because by the time you've, you've reached year 10, you've actually got a really good level of knowledge of science right across the board and mathematics, if you've taken um, science and mathematics subjects, and most people do take it to year, year nine or year 10. Um, and you're not like, um, you haven't focused on one particular area. And so what we've been doing um, with my team at Swinburne is um, we've got groups of year 10 students to design and build and launch experiments to go to the space station. And um, it's been amazing because we've allowed the teams to come in and decide what, what would you like to launch? Um, and our first team that came in said, uh, we're going to launch um, magnetorheological fluids. And my collaborators and I looked at each other and went, what's a magnetorheological fluid? <laughs> and one of the students has had done some research and found this really cool fluid that when you have a put a magnet on it, um, it moves around um, and it's um, got 
some iron particles. Um, so it's a, a really interesting fluid. And so we designed um, a, um, an experiment. They made an electrode magnet. I would never would have even thought you could make an electrode magnet, but we made one and we sent it to the space station. Everything worked beautifully, except it, um, it uh, stuck on launch. So it had high Gs on launch and it was meant to have a little moving part and that moving part um, got stuck onto another part and it didn't work. And we thought, wow, that's a great success. We learned something from that. It didn't work, but we learned something. But the, the great thing about they, these projects is we needed somebody who could do the design. We actually had to fit a, a lot of NASA paperwork for this. So we had to have someone who's really good and has that eye for detail to make sure that we were covering all of those details. Um, we had a head engineer, we had a head designer, we had a head communications person. So all of those people had to work together in the team. And we, um, you know, we just get whoever, com whoever comes along, we get diverse teams. Um, and you realise that, in fact, at the start of this experiment, nobody in our team knew how to do it. And by the end, we all learnt together how to do it. And where we didn't know how to do things, we brought in experts. So I think that's a really big lesson for us is you don't need to learn how to do everything all the time. You can do the bit that you know, or if you don't know, you can ask someone or you can look it up. You can, you can Google it. Lots of people do Google um, and then go to the next step and make sure you've, you're looking at the right information. But... Um, you don't need to know everything. And it, actually, you don't want to know everything because someone will have a different perspective to you. And when you bring it together, you have a better team. So I think by really um, understanding that, mm. we're encouraging all of us to go, okay, I can go out of my comfort zone a little bit. And um, it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter um, who you are, whether you're a boy or girl or other, um, you know, you can um, be part of this team and bring your, your own um, perspective. Yeah, and it's so important, I think, creating these opportunities, as Jason was saying, so that people actually could really can really see at an early point that these things are, um, you know, completely realistic to go for. Um, I was wondering, Geraldine, if I could come back to you. Um, working in consultancy like Deloitte, you must work across a really diverse range of different projects. So could you maybe talk a bit diversity of sort of work that a consultancy like Deloitte gets involved in in relation to space? Yeah, uh, we we do work across the space value chain. So when you think about uh, all the different areas from manufacturing of uh, either manufacturing of rockets, manufacturing of satellites, even manufacturing of some of the individual payloads or like the individual cameras and sensors that satellites carry, there's a lot of early design and manufacturing involved. So, and this goes back to that, uh, I guess, the diversity of backgrounds and the different uh, careers that you can decide to do. You, you can go for mechanical engineering, you can go for material science, and still end up working in the space industry, because going back to that initial manufacturing and design, you need to have an understanding of those things. And for example, the International Humans in a Space Summit today, we were discussing different topics on a, of a space medicine. And uh, that's another area within the space value chain that we, we, we would like to work with. And that includes things of like, how do we take life sciences or how do we take uh, biology, chemistry, biomedical engineering, and apply these to the broader space sector. That's another very, it's, it's still fairly niche when you compare it to like rocket manufacturing and satellite manufacturing, but it's a very uh, rapidly growing field within the space sector. Um, and there's also, uh, going back to the comment on space communication and space lawyers, that is also something that we see particularly at Deloitte. We, we obviously want to do a space right from an ethical perspective as well. So we need to look at the uh, not only the policy angle, but the ethics and law angle to every single space mission. So are we, are we actually considering the implications of uh, launching a rover to the moon? Like if we, if we are extracting some of the regolith, some of the material, this could end up becoming a huge uh, space mining opportunity for big companies. But like, what are some of the ethical implications of all that? At Deloitte, we, we look at pretty much everything across the space value chain, including those things like a space low, a space communications yeah. and things like that. Absolutely. And so I guess speaking about the space value chain, Mark, I wanted to come to you because 
people wouldn't necessarily think about industrial design consultancies and think, oh, they're working in space, right? So um, can you talk a bit about your role with design and industry and, and you know, how you've transitioned, I guess, from, from an academic into, into working in space um, in the value chain? So again, like my background is in manufacturing and um, academia is in a very small, very niche area uh, as a PhD is, is in um, additive manufacturing, 3D printing. Um, so a lot of things is uh, that we don't have expertise here in, and someone that no one really has touched is, it's all about science and um, mechanical engineering, nothing about manufacturing engineering. So who's gonna make all these things that can go up in space, how you design them to be better, what methods used to fabricate it and machine, et cetera. So that's where my background comes in really handy when I talk to um, startup, startup companies or companies that are developing space products. Um, a lot of the time, some of these companies have the ideas or the spin-offs out of the universities um, have these startups where these have these ideas and have these proof of concepts, but how do they make it work and work well? And how do they make it work um, easily to be built and manufactured cheaply um, and at scale? So we've done a lot of work for different companies. One of them is um, Fleet, um, Fleet Space, some of their um, satellite communication devices. We have a whole in-house team of mechanical engineers, electronic engineers, software engineers. We kind of do the whole suite and they work together and kind of mesh together to develop this end product. So everyone communicates all these different STEM and science, um, engineering, mathematics, all these uh, academic positions all come together to produce this product. The space is very hard, it's not easy. And same thing with um, medical and other industries like that. It takes a lot of skilled people to develop these products. And we kind of come in as a consultant to kind of provide that service. So people like Jason don't have to worry about it. These consultants say, Mark, solve my problem. This is what I want. And we come in and we do it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, so to provide an opportunity for the audience to ask any questions. Does anybody have any questions? One of the messages I find quite interesting is whether or not having a really good education or being able to just kind of like piece together whatever you've got and make your way in is, uh, I know there's different parts, but on the stage at the moment, there's at least three PhDs. So I, 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 on the one hand, I think it's really important the message is, you know, you've really got to achieve highly. Um, I'm a bit of that, I was a bit pretty lofty at university myself as well. But at the same time, the message is like, Come from wherever you are and make your way in. And I, you know, just wanted to bring that topic to you guys. Is that, that sometimes it seems like the message is, is not quite matching up to the actual reality in a way. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. I have a quick thing. Yeah, just, just to touch on that point. Um, might be submitting my PhD soon, but I was never that great of an, of an academic student at university. Um, my motto was "Please get degrees," as uh, is a lot of students. And actually, one of my courses I failed. And I still got into the PhD program. So you don't have to be the best academic um, student. It's just the passion that drives you and pushes you there. That's really what it matters. And you, if you want to get somewhere, you'll get there as long as you keep pushing and trying. All right. So, so what, are you, what are you looking to do? Me personally? Yeah. Uh, Working in human spaceflight. Human spaceflight. All right. All right. So um, I, I got my undergraduate degree from a... a uh, small military school in Virginia, and then I was in the army. That's kind of like the backstory to the backstory. I, I was a grunt in a mud pit in Bosnia, uh, and I was bored. I barely graduated. I was the I wasn't quite the the anchor man. There's an expression in, in in our school where the 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 anchor person is like the person who got the worst grades but still graduated. <laughs> you know, they had to give some glory to this person. Uh, and and I I uh, like when I was graduating high school. I barely graduated high school too. Like I was, yeah, you know, similar. Some themes there. I wasn't a good student uh, to the point where my 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 college advisor said, "You gotta you gotta beg and pray to get into a TAFE, right?" Which which I mean, honestly, you learn some good skill, skills at a TAFE. So it's yeah, I, I don't want to undersell like the actual skills you get from a, from a TAFE. The, the the whole point is, I ended up graduating with a, with a um, that was a two O in in Go. Uh, uh, what's the Australian equivalent? It's a 
it's, it's a, it's a what, what's that? Peas get degrees. It was a little better than a peas. I was a little bit, a little bit better than peas, but not much. Well, not much. Uh, and I did my time in the service. And when I got out of the service, I moved back to Colorado, where I wanted to start my space industry. And I just started applying for jobs. And what I found was that nobody really cared what my grades were as an undergrad. They cared that I got the degree, a bachelor's. And first job was I was doing um, insulin pumps for diabetics. I was like a, a tester, a really low grade. $15 an hour tester. Next job I had after that was testing the International Space Station. Effort, time equals success. Stick with it. That's the advice. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? It's starting anything new is tough, uh, always. And it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough now, too. It never... It never stops being tough, but the, the, the challenge has changed. At first, the challenge is how do I get people to, to realize what I'm doing is something special? Uh, the first challenge is how do I make something that's special and actually make sure it's special to the world, not just special in your own head? Um, and you know, as, as, you, as you get a little bits of success, and again, persistence is always the key to success. Uh, and also having very good friends around you is, is, is key to success. No, I don't know. I don't know if there's a a, a measuring stick for that. Uh, you, you plan until you think you've, you've you've got something which could work, and you try it, uh, and you test it, and if it fails, you let it go. Uh, and if you get a little bit of success, uh, then you continue. Now, what you need to realize: sometimes success or failure is is part. It, it includes two different things. One is your abilities and your ability to is to push through the problems. Uh, the other bit of success is your environment. And your environment has, you don't really control that too much, right? So when, when I founded Sabre in 2008, there was no space agency. There were no investors interested in space. Uh, and it was very, very tough. But, you know, eventually the environment catches up. Sometimes you could push it a little bit, and I did a lot of pushing back then. Um, but right now, it's a very positive environment for space in, in, in Australia. For human space, light is actually growing, right? So if you have something that you want to do and you really, really want to do it, then you have to be willing to say, you know what? I don't care if it fails at first. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Um, there's a question up the front here as well. Yeah, I, I did. Um, when I when I graduated with a nanotechnology degree, I was thinking of like, oh, well, if I can not find a job as a nanotechnologist, whatever that actually means, I can probably look for jobs in um, pharmaceutical companies because I did biotechnology as one of the courses um, that are compulsory within the nanotechnology curriculum. So I did have certain ideas as to what I could do based on the skills, on the knowledge that I gained in uni, but it goes back to like, what am I really passionate about, right? And uh, going back to that question of like, um, you, you need to have a PhD to work in the space industry, that, that is not the case. I think it's really passion what drew me back to the, uh, to the space industry. Because I did have other options. I knew when I graduated with my PhD as well, I could probably go for pharmaceutical companies again, or I could even go for a postdoc and at some point become a university professor, but that's not what I wanted to do. And uh, that's why I joined Deloitte, because I wanted to explore other alternatives. And turns out there was a space alternative in there. So I think that there's definitely, diff it's good always to have a backup, I feel, uh, especially when it comes to uh, an STEM education because sometimes you might want to, um, you might really, really like, I don't know, electrical engineering, or you maybe want to build a car and that's always been your dream. But um, 
today in Australia, there are not really many options uh, to build a car if that's what you want to do. So it's always good to use the skills that you gain uh, throughout your education and apply it somewhere else, have a backup, but always go back to like what your passion really is and try to find a way to go back to that passion. Yes. I think maybe the speaker one for you, Professor Kilborn. So the astronomy part of that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the the number of astronomers in Australia is about eight hundred to a thousand. So I don't know, is that a lot? It seems like a lot, but maybe it's not that much. Um, so the career path for astronomy is sort of limited in some ways, in that you know to be an astrophysicist um, is Kind of difficult but the skills that you learn in your degree is applicable anywhere and um, I think it's got one of the lowest unemployment rates is a, a trained astro astrophysicist. In terms of um, jobs across the sector uh, there's a wide range of jobs that uh, um, advertise there's things like data analytics as well as engineering and so on. I think that I, I mean I'm looking at Jason here but I think the number the engineers would be increasing over time. I'm going to interview you. What do you think? The, uh... <laughs> so we, before, before the agency started, before the agency even started, 20, we used to track this, uh, 800 space engineers a year and, 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 and answering your question more directly, yeah. uh, if you're a mechatronics engineer in Australia, you could be mechatronics space, you could specialize. Uh, and, and you can change your mind. You're young. You've got, you could change your mind three times before you got to even think about being worried about it, right? So make mistakes with glory. Just make the mistakes with glory. You know, it's okay for the rocket to blow up, but let it detonate completely. You know? but, uh, but these days, I, I think it's, it's, it's higher. Uh, and what's more important is now there's so many jobs opening up. Everybody's saying, we're the engineers and, and they need mechatronics software. What Australia needs is a real space engineering degree, uh, like you have in other countries. Because other countries, because they've been used to doing space for so long, the degree will have, it'll be similar to aeronautical, similar, because you'll get the fluid flows and some of the chemistry, but also specific the application of math to orbital mechanics, the application of mechatronics to satellite engineering, things like that. And there was one more question. Oh, gosh, I don't know where to start. For my job, I get to come to conferences like this and talk to really, really smart people like these people. Um, it's amazing. And also talk to students and it's constantly invigorating. So always hearing new ideas, um, thinking about the future, thinking how we can do things better and just working with really smart and enthusiastic people. Uh, quite, quite simply, being a, a part of, of the engine of humanity that's going to grow our species into Moon and Mars and beyond. Every little bit of engineering that we do, we see as a part of that future. I really enjoy talking to people and kind of being next to their passion, being involved in their desire to kind of create something new and push the boundaries. Um, to quite similar to, to everybody else, it's just that talking to people and uh, kind of you know bathing in their passion really, it really helps you really be invigorated for, you know, for your career. Yeah. Talking to people or I'm just interacting with, just the, there's a, like a glimmer in, in your eye, like a little glint and it's like they've realized something and they've discovered something new. And another thing that I really love is learning something from, from people that come in, like students that come in or perspectives that I've never even thought about before. So it's just really interesting being sort of a, a crucible to all those opinions and things and then changing the conversation into something that works for them, so works for you guys. So just that, uh, I don't know, I really appreciate that kind of uh, a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling of, of chatting with you guys like that. So <laughs> there we go. Um, the thing that I really like is just to uh, continuously learn about new technologies and uh, at Deloitte Space, we work with multiple space startups, some do manufacturing, some do mission operations, 
others want to build a rover and we get to explore all of that and just to have conversations with engineers that are currently designing these amazing pieces of technologies like I am amazed by every single stakeholder interview that I've ever had because I learned just so much. So my current job is working in heart research. And for me, it's something that's very fascinating, very exciting for me, uh, working in science, working with patients, working with a range of people like cardiologists, clinicians, as well as scientists, um, with students, medical students, as well as some biomedical engineers who are working with medical devices in our group. So it's very exciting because I get to learn a lot of different things from a lot of different people. And I also love spending time in the lab. I love doing that. I love presenting data, sharing data. Um, communicating with other people. So for me, my job and what I do is I'm always around science and I'm always reading what's happening, always being updated what's in the field. And if I get to do that in space, I feel like, you know, I pretty much reached the ultimate goal and I've you know, combined all of my passions, but definitely just being involved in science all the time. Um, it's very exciting for me. And maybe it's because I'm still early and I'm still at the beginning of my career, but it's something I think is really fascinating. So when you pick something, make sure it's something not only that you know, you're passionate about that people tell you, but something that you really value. You value that knowledge, you value that practice, you value being in that field, you appreciate the other people in the field with you. Well, that seems like a really great place, I think, to wrap things up. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've heard today is if you're somebody that knows what you want to do, just keep persisting with that passion and, and keep going because you will get there in the end, whether you're getting great marks or you're not, it doesn't matter. Um, you will be able to get to where you want to get to. But also if you don't know what you want to do, that's fine too. It's all part of the journey. So, um, you know, we hope that a whole heap of you are going to end up with brilliant space careers one way or the other. So please join me in thanking our panel.